Welcome everyone to Radicalize Truth Survives. We are an investigative show about disinformation, and boy, have we been doing some investigating for you. Uh, breaking news for us, we have the return of Craig Unger. We're so excited. Right. So stay for that. He's our special guest. We're going to be talking about how there's no off-ramp for Putin at this juncture. We're also going to be talking about uh, trying to find some uh, folks involved in tech at the, at the highest level that might be willing to create algorithms for good. So it's going to be a really exciting conversation. Um, I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm here with Jim Stewartson, High Fidelity, and Sean Connor. These are my favorite anti-fascists. Well, okay, I guess Paul Mason would be my favorite anti-fascist, but my other favorite anti-fascist. <laughs> I'll um, Paul. We all have a crush on Paul. Love yes, that you guys come back week after week. We read every single email, every single comment. We thank you so much for your support. We thank our patrons for their yes, support. Thank you. We have a very exciting event coming up that's going to include all our patrons. So again, thank you for uh, supporting this show. It means a lot to us. Okay, uh, let's just jump right into Front Loaded. Front Loaded. All right, so just uh, uh, three quick things, if I can remember them. I'm out of printer ink, so the show is unscripted, as if you didn't know, but everything has to come from memory. Um, I have been tweeting and retweeting incessantly multiple threads that I did last week on Twitter, at uh, Heidi underscore Kuda, uh, one of them being how Deutsche Bank <laughs> did something very unique. It was rated last week because it blew the whistle on itself, and so please take a look at that. We have some interpretations from our uh, money laundering expert, Martin Steele, who's a big part of the show, as you guys know. Uh, he did point out, of course, that, you know, back, uh, you know, in 1929, millionaires didn't want to be poor and they jumped out of windows. Could be. A lot of sanctions happening with uh, oligarchs right now. But he talked about how Deutsche Bank might be a little bit concerned about the wrath of dead oligarchs and perhaps they'd rather deal with you know uh repercussions well, to, to perhaps money laundering than dealing with mafiosos so there's a rash of dead deutsche bank executives too <laughs> which we're going to talk about which we're going to talk about so so imagine being a bank that is known to have money laundered money for uh russia and oligarchs that is no uh secret They've been fined, uh, you know, repeatedly for such activities. Imagine being so concerned that you're going to actually blow the whistle on yourself. There was a, a raid in 2018. Nothing came of it. There was a raid again uh, two days ago, so three days ago, probably by the time this airs. Anyway, so there are some interesting details uh, about some of the players involved. And imagine being um, in a situation where you might be an exec, say, at a bank, and you might be so concerned about your um, health that you might actually prefer to deal with, um, you know, perhaps incarceration versus, I mean, there appears to be a rash of suiciding. We'll just leave it right there. And uh, I think I have one other item, but I don't remember it right now, so we'll talk about it later. So let's get right into word phrase of the week, please. All right. So our word phrase of the week this week is accelerationism. You may ask yourself, what the hell is accelerationism, I find? Well, let me tell you. Accelerationism is a doomsday ideology that pushes for chaos and destruction. It runs across a number of schools of thought. Uh, but basically, it believes that capitalism needs to be sped up. The poor need to get poorer. The rich need to get richer. Uh, technological change needs to happen faster. People need to be, oh implanting chips in their brain, crap like that. And it's incredibly dangerous. Um, just to, to, to uh, emphasize how dangerous it is, accelerationism is the basis of great replacement theory. Right? Great replacement theory being the false idea that there's some conspiracy to eliminate white people from the earth. So they're the, 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 the neo-Nazis literally think this is a race between this chaos and technological uh, accelerationism and replacement of white people. 
So this used to be something that was only in these little chat rooms and, you know, horrendous boards on the dark web. Now it's on fucking Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Accelerationism is behind all of this shit. And I'm going to be talking about Elon Musk in a little bit. And he is the ultimate and probably most uh, dangerous accelerationist. Uh, speaking of point. speaking of Tucker Carlson, did you guys see the New York Times? Uh, yeah, the three part uh, about yeah. the, the minute for minute uh, ratings that they look at, which is pretty pretty fascinating. That so they look at the there's either a quarter hour um, scales or the Fox looks at minute by minute um, ratings for their viewership, and so yeah. they found that uh, the viewership minute by minute was most uh, in the highest ratings were for the great replacement theory yes. for the white supremacist content. Yeah. So right. they were in doing what their viewership calls for, right? Okay. It's, more, it's more content from the great replacement theory and from the white supremacist realm versus yeah. Yeah. what we were talking about minute, that yeah. exactly. It showed basically how the industrial outrage complex is fed, right. how it's created, how it's fed, and that is something that we will continue to talk about on this show because we are seeing how culture war and the ability to create moral panic and moral outrage is actually feeding and fueling and funding much of the what used to be what, what used to be called Republicans. I don't think we have a good name for this party yet, other than fifth column. Yeah. Well, one thing I would like to point out uh, is you know I've done a lot of research into a lot of these people at the top of this, and if you look at Peter Thiel's fascination with the dark enlightenment. Or if you look at Steve Bannon's fascination with Julian, uh, Julius Avola's The Fourth Turning. Mm -hmm. This is all accelerationism bullshit. Mm -hmm. it needs yeah. To stop. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <sighs> well, before we get into why it matters, I just remembered the third um, story that I wanted to point out to our friend. Because it's a positive story and we always try to add a little levity. It turns out that the Russian women are actually leading the resistance against the Ukraine war in Russia. And they are doing all kinds of things and trying to cheat and figure out ways where they can, um, you know, do their protesting without necessarily, um, obviously, you know, being harmed or incarcerated. And one of the things they're doing is writing messages on money because that is something Excellent. that they can do that's not illegal, apparently. Mm -hmm. And so please look for that. There's an incredible article in, um, in uh, Harris. So look for that. But go support Russian women of the resistance in any way you can. I would suggest actually picking up a couple copies of the Pussy Riot album, which is a Russian band. Oh, that's great. Band. Yeah, yeah, right. I love them. They're Excellent. awesome. Yeah, yeah, who who have been you know imprisoned and and all yeah. kinds of you know just yes. horrendous horrendous shit. And by the way, you know, look, it's women. It's always women who are who are saving yep. us from you know from men. From from men. Let's <laughs> let's accelerate that. Let's accelerate <laughs> women. So glad I brought that up. That felt so good. Right, right here. All right, so let's jump into why it matters. Why does it matter? Why high fidelity? Amazing. All right. First story this week is Yuri tries for blurry. And everybody's like, what the hell is that? Investor Yuri Milner. Oh, God. Uh, who has put a ton of money into Twitter and Facebook. Is trying to wash his reputation. By giving one hundred million dollars to the Ukraine, mm -hmm. and I think people need to recognize just because you're doing something nice right now does not um, does not make up for the fact that he was instrumental in laundering a shitload of money through Silicon Valley, creating social media weapons that were used to harm Americans and harm democracy globally, and also put a bunch of money in Jared Kushner's pocket 
through a company called Padre. Yep. So when you see these billionaires, oh, look at my philanthropy, look how great I am, don't believe them. Well, I think the, uh, you know, Ukraine should take that money and do some good with it, but it should not be able to uh, whitewash his reputation. There's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of money laundering through philanthropy. And there are actual, you know, charities that are starving for funding that rejected Facebook's money for that very reason. Yeah. I mean, look, if, if Yuri Milner wants to become a whistleblower and fucking explain everything he's been doing for the last 20 years to undermine American democracy through Putin's assets in America, if he wants to come fucking out and tell everyone exactly what he's been doing and why and for who, maybe we can like pay any fucking attention to what he has to say or what he does. Otherwise, it's just money. Take his fucking money, but he is a criminal who has been at war with the United States, and no one should be laundering this dude. Well, so, uh, it, actually, it, it was I would like to hear the part of the story that Yuri tells about the Edge Foundation dinners in Silicon Valley with Jeffrey mm-hmm. Epstein. That might be an interesting story. Or why his uh, business partner colleagues in a bank that is no longer listed on his LinkedIn are all in prison. So, you know, That'd for, for racketeering, too. yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm still looking forward to talking to Craig Unger about some of this stuff because, again, you know, there's a lot of people who do, do not seem to know what's really going on in our country. And as Craig Unger always says, it's what's legal that's hurting us. And, again, that theme, legal but harmful, will be something that we will be uh, – just completely pounding away at. Okay, well, thank you for that high five. What's gonna, up next? I'm going to wrap this up with one. I'm going to wrap this up with one more point, and it's a very important point that I think everybody can agree on. If everybody paid their fair share of taxes, we wouldn't need philanthropy anymore. Well, I'll take it even a step further. If there weren't tax breaks for the wealthy in philanthropy, we'd see what people really wanted to support and what they didn't want to support. That's true. There's so much. There's so much profit that goes on and so many tax breaks that make it enticing to launder money through philanthropy. So there's a lot. You're absolutely 100% right. All right. Hey. Story number two this week. Deutsche Down. And yes, as Heidi mentioned earlier in the show, uh, Deutsche did whistleblow on itself and was raided. However, uh, what I want to talk about is something a little bit more humane. Um, a whistleblower on Deutsche Bank this week, an individual named Val Brokesmith, uh, was found dead, apparently from a drug overdose. Mm-hmm. And Val was a very tragic figure. Um, he had a very, very rough life. Um, he did provide, you know, federal investigators and journalists with a ton of documents on Deutsche Bank that he had gotten from his father. His father worked at Deutsche Bank and, uh, for whatever reason, committed suicide when Val was younger. Uh, but that doesn't negate the fact that there are multiple bodies around Deutsche Bank. All you have to do is look up Deutsche Bank, dead bankers, suicide, and you'll see there's at least three, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing that, to me, is exceptionally personal uh, is, again, the guy who got me kicked off Twitter, Sergey Grishin, mm-hmm. he actually met his Israeli business partner, Dovi Francis, in 2008 at Deutsche Bank. And we know what was going on at Deutsche Bank in 2008. Mm-hmm. So people need to pay a lot of attention to Deutsche. Thank you for that. We'll be talking more about Deutsche and Hellscape, I believe. So... And finally, last story this week is SCOTUS attack. And the Supreme Court ruled this week against a blind and deaf woman who had asked for a translator to be available. Um, One was not provided for her. She was told she could just write things down and 
signal in other ways. Uh, she sued. Her, her dignity uh, had been impacted. Right? The way she interacted with the world had been impacted. So she sued. And what the Supreme Court ruled was that just because someone has done you emotional harm, uh, emotional trauma, uh, you are not allowed to get financial compensation for that. And that is an attack on every person in the United States because one of the ways we can sue uh, is when we are, you know, subjected to racism, uh, ableism. Emotional distress, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let, let's, let's, let's talk for a second about what they did say you can sue for, which is for helping somebody get an abortion. Mm -hmm. They made it legal for people to sue other people for for helping people do get a a health service that has been constitutionally protected in America, but they will not let you sue if somebody intentionally causes you fucking emotional harm. That should tell you everything about going back to another word phrase, authoritarian capture of our yeah. Supreme Court. Yep. Well, yes, also, as you guys know, I do not recognize members of the Supreme Court as authentic because they were posted up there by an inauthentic president. So I think we, you know, this is going to be an ongoing battle. Are we just going to sit around and just take their shitty rulings from judges who should never have been there in the first place, appointed by, you know, Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society and the most extreme you know, uh, circumstances that our country seen from an inauthentic president. I don't, I don't care how, I'll, I'll say this forever. We had an inauthentic president and then he did some inauthentic pardons and he appointed inauthentic judges all throughout our country. So what we're going to do about it remains to be seen, but. It sure would be nice if we could find out what the hell the FBI was hiding in those 4,000 tips that were received on Brent mm. Kavanaugh. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so thank you for that. matters this week. Very, mm -hmm. very sobering why it matters, but very, very important. Thank you, Hi-Fi. And I think we're going to jump into uh, Sean's brief legal brief. Brief legal briefs. Hey guys. So, um, <clears throat> brief little piece. We're we're gonna follow up on the tragic um, uh, Selena Rodriguez story, which is the 11 year old who took her own life uh, from bullying uh, as a result of her mother claims uh, bullying on Snapchat and uh, Instagram. So they filed a lawsuit against Meta and against Snap, um, and that's proceeding through the courts. Well, today I found another case, another lawsuit from a 17 year old again horribly sad. His name is uh, Chris Dolly. He has taken his life as a 17 year old from bullying and his mother is suing Snap and Meta. Um, the company or the organization, Heidi, that we should look into having on the show is the Social Media Victims Law Center. And they have filed suits on behalf of both of these families. So there is some, unfortunately, as a result of this tragic, uh, as a result of these tragic occurrences, there is an organization that is standing up for pursuing the rights of and attempting to hold these social media companies accountable for the role in and liability for the tragic deaths of these, in, in one case, a preteen, and in another case, a 17 year old. Um, the, and I'm not going to read the, I'm not going to read the, the complaint. It's, it's as horrifying and tragic as you can imagine. Um, um it's, it's, so it's, it's, sad. it's very frustrating, but the exciting thing is they are pursuing these new legal causes of action. Which is a defective product, which hopefully would circumvent the 230 um, uh, uh, protections that they have, and uh, we'll see. But I, I think we should get in touch with these guys. I'd love to have yeah, them. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. And, it's, and really, uh, one just just sort of uh, give them our compliments and our support because they are doing the hard, hard legislative work that is, you know, seems like an uphill battle, but has to be done in order to set precedent. It has to be done in order to get this stuff on the record because the details in these complaints are horrifying and this is not for general consumption. It's so sad, it's heart-wrenching. This is an 11 year old, yeah. 11, an 11 year old. I have a 10 year old. This is an 11 right. year old who right. took her own life because of right. bullying on these platforms. So I gotta say my son was seriously um, trolled at that age 
and uh, it was really hard to see him go through that. And what Nadine Smith, who's being trolled for her mm-hmm. work standing up to DeSantis, said, you know, I'm not a teenage girl. In other words, I'm an adult as I deal with these attacks. I wonder what would have happened if I had been younger when I was dealing with the heaviest of my attacks. Now I'm I'm not immune to it. I still hate it. But it's like every time there's something joyful that happens yeah. and I want to celebrate it, you know, like today was the day that I got my 5,000 cup of coffee from those who support my yeah, independent yeah. investigative yeah. reporting. That is a yeah. moment for me. Ten months ago, after doing this for six years, five years at the time, I wanted to know, do people care? Well, it turned out that they do. So, of course, you know, even with not having, not allowing people who I don't follow to comment, just because of the constant trauma and abuse that occurs, uh, you know, you still get some, some, you know, a bit shit, you know, uh, uh, quote tweets. And yeah. it's like, you know, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm, older, but I still feel very much like a victim of social media, and of course, our hearts mm-hmm. go out to these families, you know. You are, you are, you are a victim of social media, and it's, it, and in Hellscape, <laughs> we're going to talk about that, we're going to talk about how, not how it's been weaponized, and how we ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, yes, yeah. well, let's get right into it then. Jim Stewartson's hellscape. Oh, fuck. All right. So, look, uh, we have a problem, everybody. Um, and his name is Elon Musk. Uh, this is no joke. Um, a major, major battle in World War III. And I'm just going to put it on the fucking table right now. Elon Musk is capturing territory for him and his allies in their quest, speaking of accelerationism, to accelerate chaos, destruction, and the undermining of democracy. Um, Sean, do you have that first image? Yep. Full fucking stop. So, I created this image. Um, to just sort of get my head around who are the, the, you know, the kind of primary figures running this show. And I put a lot in Musk down there for a reason next to Trump. Um, because like Trump, Elon Musk is a cult leader. He's got 90 million followers on Twitter now. He's going up a million every day now. Elon Musk is a bad actor. Elon Musk wants to take Twitter over so that he can accelerate destruction of democracy. And I know that sounds, you know, may sound kind of crazy, but I promise you that is exactly what's going on. Do we have that second image? So here is what Elon Musk Really, truly, and I know it may be hard to believe, and maybe you think he's just trolling. He really wants to terraform Mars. I'm not kidding. He's trying, he wants to go to Mars, terraform it, turn it into Earth, and blow this one up. Leave it behind for all the rubes to, to, you know, deal with the charred remains. Um, and, and, if you think I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, look at the moves that he's made. Just look at what this guy has done. Um, I'm going to be writing a piece soon um, showing how Elon Musk has already weaponized Twitter. Uh, do we have that next one? Mm-hmm. So, uh, Elon Musk, uh, in, in, just this set of tweets, right, um, is making clear what he's trying to do. He is trying to destroy the idea that there is truth, that there is meaning in um, our political discourse. So he's saying the far left hate, hates everyone, themselves included, without 
in any way defining what that means, right? And we'll talk about what he does mean in a minute. But I'm no fan of the far right either, either which is true. He is not a fan of the far right. He he believes that he his ideology is completely separate and superior to those. At the same time, look what he's doing. Promoting fucking cocaine. Now, you could think that's an Ed Ward joke. When 90 million fucking people see that, a, a bunch of people are going to do cocaine that weren't going to do it before. Because they're like, oh, well, I must think it's awesome, right? Like, it's these little, these constant erosion into our, our moral fabric as a society, as mm -hmm. the concept of truth at all, um, becomes questionable. Well, can we go to the next one? Yep. Let's see. Is this okay? So here's Elon Musk promoting his friend, and they are friends, good friends, Joe Rogan. Um, and what he's doing here is harassing um, uh, Vijay Agadi, who is um, head of uh, Twitter safety, um, because he ha has already infiltrated Twitter's executives. All, you know, from Jack Dorsey to Paul Singer all the way through. But he is now trying to harass and target any employee in Twitter that will not do every single thing that he wants. Um, and so he's hiring and if, if there's a great thread by, um, uh, a medium story by Jackie Singh, who used to be security for Joe Biden. Showing in gory detail how trolls get paid to harass people on Twitter for Elon Musk's very specific agenda. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be talking more about that and how that actually relates to me, um, in the next few days. And, and we'll see that. But I wanted to spend the rest of Hellscape talking about this next image. The next one? Yes. Okay. Because this next image is the center of the propaganda and, you know, brain fucking that Elon Musk has apparently suffered himself and wants to inflict on the rest of the earth. So what are you saying in this, in this goofy little image, right? And it looks so simple and and cute and aw, and you know, look, he's an edge lord and he's doing a meme. This is third position KGB Soviet propaganda. Okay? The 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 KGB um sets up third position. Um they set up um ideologically neutral um um system so that they can attack all sides of a political system at the same time. So Elon Musk is uh, over here saying, oh, I haven't moved. My ideology ha hasn't moved. It's that the left has gotten much more extreme, is what he's trying to say. He's trying to say the fucking left, right, is are the ones who have gotten extreme. Mm -hmm. And the way he's proving that is by saying woke, Progressive are screaming bigot. Now, that right there is the one of the single most dangerous pieces of propaganda you can put out there. You know, it's it's just saying that the racism, the 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 fascism, the harm, the sociopathy, that everything that's been happening on the right is normal. Mm -hmm. That that is okay. And it's the left who's objecting to their racism and fascism that is the problem. That is Go Goebbels level propaganda. Yeah, and that's Nazi propaganda. Yeah. And it shows, it shows, it implies here the LOL 
from the right, right? The right's just exactly. a funny, they're just a humorous little side that's just ha ha ha. They, we they, need they, to talk about that. We need to talk about exactly that. Yes, that's where I was going next is okay. LOL. LOL is what you're saying the last fucking five or six years of radicalization. LOL to January 6th. That's what he's saying. He's saying, ha ha, the one that, that was fucking funny. Um, that, because he thinks so. He thinks it's funny. They do. These people, those 12 guys at the, at the front, all of this is what they want. Because they have no empathy left. They have no morals left. They have no, no ethical boundaries. And all of us are their pawns in an information war. Thank you. And I want to go first. Hi Fi. My hand went up first because you win. <laughs> so much of what so much of what Jim has said has really, really, really um hit home for me. Um number one, Jim, I have learned not to underestimate you. So when you say things like he's trying to drive up Martian real estate, I'm not dismissive. I'm open minded about this shit. I know because I've known you this long now and every time you say something you know, uh, things keep coming true. So I'm not dismissive of any of this, but here's what I want to say. Weaponized irony. I just had a conversation with my friend Mark Metz about this, and he was talking about a Medium article he read two years ago, how out of game or gate came this weaponized irony. I'm going to call you this, and then I'm just going to be like, aha, aren't I so funny? I'm being yep. ironic. Exactly. And I think that is something that uh, we need to continue to probe. The other thing that Mark said that I thought was really telling is he thinks that part of what may be behind this territorial grab uh, is to kill. There's no place like Twitter that has allowed people to crowdsource investigation. It's a news site and it's an investigative site and a lot of indie people. Like civilian, us have, civilian journalists, yeah. Civilian journalists, me with my media background, you with your, uh, you know, tech background a hi-fi data background, your legal background, come together and start putting together a lot of these pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. Imagine if you could actually kill that. So I think that's something we need to think about. They, I mean, they did. That's that's what they're doing, yeah. I mean, and also consider that the Gaslit Nation girls met on Twitter. I mean, there's a number of right. these, these things that we have seen as our sort of staples that Every were... Every single one of us met on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so two, two other things real quick, and then I will uh, turn the... Uh, you know, I'll give it a, give the mic to high five. Right, one, right. one thing is that as I always do, I am continually the target. Even the way I have my, my account set up now, I'm continually the target of toxic level, uh, you know, harassment, misogyny, always. And, and, and we're talking about, you know, we haven't even mentioned, uh, Musk and his crypto and Musk and his misogyny, but those are things that I think are very important to, continually look at but i'm continually reporting you know toxic levels of misogynistic harassment to twitter safety and i continually get back uh we need to know more and mm. every time that happens i feel like they're saying what were you wearing mm. like fuck this you can either see that somebody you know using me this type of language which i'm not going to repeat against an independent investigative reporter, you can either tell that that's toxic level misogyny or you can't. Asking Listen. me to give them more and tell them, tell me, you know, in effect what I'm wearing just um, feels like I'm being re-victimized. You are. And and Twitter's fucking safety, and I'm saying this out loud right now, knows it. Uh, they well, know. They the absolutely know what's going on. They, they protect... The operators of these fucking troll armies and cults yeah. that run around Twitter traumatizing people like you and me and, and everybody that we care about on Twitter. Yeah. Everybody right. we care about, everybody we know, yeah. everyone who comes yeah. and talks anything nice about any of us gets fucking traumatized on that platform. Yeah. And yeah. Twitter safety knows it and they're letting it happen on purpose because Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey are neo-reactionary nut jobs who think that that's awesome. Well, I will say also um, that, you know, 
I don't know. It's been it's been an ongoing um, level of pain that I wish to um, you know wish not to live the rest of my life feeling this way. And I feel like as long as I'm on that platform and as long as misogynistic douches. Uh, are going to be protecting these people. Um, maybe the next investigation, I know you're already working on it, is who and why are they protecting certain accounts? It's beyond, oh, I, oh I, it's I beyond, okay, it's beyond, oh, well, they know the terms of, you know, the let's, terms yeah, of yeah, these no. agreements. It's no, beyond no, no. TOC. Yeah. We ain't got to look past that. Let's okay. wait on, yeah, we have that coming up, Heidi. Let's wait on that okay. for another okay. time. One last thing I want to say, and Dave Troy said this, and I think it's very fucking important because they keep on talking about free speech. Let's have this free speech. We know we're talking about bullying that would not be acceptable in the real world. So we're really not talking about that. But this is what Dave Troy said. That's very fucking important. The task of dealing with disinformation is, in fact, a counterintelligence matter with public health consequences for societal well-being and individual cognitive security. We have erred by framing it in terms of speech, freedom, or truth, which are tangential. And he is fucking right. Yeah, as Dave usually is. Hi, Pat, what do you have? Can we wrap it up? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I uh, first off, I would just like to point out how much the little fucking trolls whine and whimper about how when I cause them trouble, I'm a terrible, awful, horrible person. But when they do it, it's fine. Anyway, haha, fuck those people. Second LOL. thing is, lol. Lol. Um, <laughs> second, second thing is, uh, look, I, I say it constantly. I'm not joking. Elon Musk is a fucking problem, yeah. and the reason he's a problem, there, there's a couple different things. One, his dad sold a plane to a bunch of gangsters to get money for his apartheid emerald mine, right? Uh, two, the biggest one that sticks out to me about Elon fucking Musk. Is the pedo cave guy? Yeah. Story, right? Important. Everyone saw that happen. Everyone watched that happen. It was obvious what happened, and yet, and yet, Mr. Ung, uh, Mr. Uller, sorry, uh, Mr. Pedo Cave guy. I apologize for calling. Um, he lost his cave, mm -hmm. and who was his attorney? Mm -hmm. Eldon Fucking Wood. All right. <laughs> now that's not that big of a thing. That's not that big of a thing by itself, right? Except Elon Musk's former co-worker and co-founder of Palantir with Peter Thiel, a guy named Joseph fucking Lonsdale, he was accused of doing some terrible things to a young woman named Elise Clority, mm -hmm. right? And she was winning her case. And she went to court. She lost her court case. And who was her attorney? L. Lynn fucking Wood. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. Why, it just why like this matters? Problem. Why this matters truly too is because we know this. All of us know this. I'm willing to bet 99.9% .9 plus more, more, more don't know what you're even talking about. And you know why? Because the media glorified these bastards. There was so much money to be made. They ignored the misogyny. They ignored the name calling. They ignored these horrible things they do. And right now they're ignoring crypto. Well, go ahead and ignore it at your own fucking risk. Yeah, um, that, that, that's a whole other story. But just briefly on Ellen, on Lynn Wood. And then we I mean, have to get on to that gym. We have to move on. I know. Mm -hmm. So, so Lynn, Lynn Wood, one of the biggest, Q, most dangerous QAnon propagandists that there was, right? Yeah. Was right. too, was too mind fucked for Mike Flynn. So Mike Flynn lied to him. This guy is, he, he's, he's, an op. He has been for a long time, and and the fact that that this guy, QAnon propagandist Lynn Wood, yeah. was was the lawyer for two of the people that went went up against Elon Musk and his allies. Come on, man. Well, uh, and, more shall and, be and Kyle revealed. Rittenhouse's lawyer. Oh yeah. Lawyer, really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, yeah. yeah. Let's not. Let's. Sorry. Let's just, so it's a lot. that is enough fucking hell escaping for one for yeah, one episode. Right? Now we're gonna get into the joie de brief of uh Craig Unger's <laughs> mind. Uh yeah. we're gonna we're we're auditioning him uh for the new Walter Cronkite and hopefully uh he's gonna take us up on that. Uh in any case, without further ado, 
Let's bring in our dear friend, Craig Unger. And Craig, we're so happy to see you. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. <laughs> oh my gosh, so much has happened since we had you in January. An entire decade has gone by, it feels like. Um, these um, conversations always move too quickly, so we're going to jump right in. You just did an article um, about CPAP going to Hungary. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's interesting. See, I mean, CPAC has uh, gone so far to the right; it's amazing. And and their their next conference is uh, is in Budapest, and they formed an alliance with Viktor Orban. And it's quite extraordinary if you look at the history. I, I one thing I've been trying to do is to make people aware of uh, uh, what's really happening with Russia. And Hungary is part of it in a way. The, 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 they are really there's as much as thirty trillion dollars in dark money out there from various oligarchs uh, from Russia, not just Russia, from Saudis and so forth. And and it fuels. Um, uh, it, it's become a powerful geopolitical force in a way. And we've seen now that the Republican Party is becoming a tool of all that. It's been going on, and I've been trying to show this in my books, but back to the 90s, certainly once the Soviet Union fell, there was a gold rush, of course, and Russia was the, uh, the Russian Federation was the wild, wild west, and you saw a mafia state evolve. And Hungary is moving into that orbit, and now you see that CPAC, which is uh, the, 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 has been for 50 years most powerful and influential a conservative organization in the country is uh, uh, going to Hungary. It is sponsored by Hungary. Orban will be the keynote speaker. And I, I, I think you see, see an alliance too with people like Tucker Carlson or Orban. Uh, Tucker broadcast spent a week over there broadcasting a show on Fox News there. Uh, so I, I think all of that is very, very dangerous. And that is the force that's taking over the Republican Party, whether Trump uh, comes back or not. All I know is I'm sure when you saw Tucker Carlson uh, basically introducing Orban to the Fox Millions, you must have actually, that must have been like a gigantic red flag for you. Right. And, and, and the history of it, it goes back to uh, even uh, more than 25 years ago, Arthur Finkelstein was the chief uh, Republican political consultant. And at the time I was in Boston, I, I was editor of Boston Magazine, and uh, my girlfriend mentioned she met this new gay couple, David and Arthur, Arthur Finkelstein. And I thought it couldn't be the political consultant because he was very, very right wing. And he was the man uh, behind... Uh, Really, the, the far right homophobic senators like Jesse Helms, Strom Thurmond, wow. all, all, all of them, uh, he controlled the Republican senatorial campaign committee. And yet here he was, he had actually moved to Massachusetts so he and his male lover could adopt uh, a child wow. while the, the, uh, uh, the candidates he elected were defeating a gay right bill that would have uh, outlawed federal discrimination against gays. So I th uh, and and he uh, became very very close to Viktor Orban. He he had a home in Budapest for ten years. He is the Republican. He he died I think in 2017, about five years ago. But he's the Republican political consultant who made the word liberal a vile epithet that no one could wow. run as a liberal anymore. And, wow. and, and he, 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 he was single-handedly responsible for that. And within Hungary, uh, he launched the, uh, you know, very anti-Semitic campaign against, uh, George Soros. I mean, that's one of the extraordinary things about Finkelstein. He was a, a gay dude who was the Can, can I, can I mention? Wow. Can uh, I mention somebody and, else like that, um, just briefly, which is Glenn Greenwald? Uh, yes, yeah. Glenn Greenwald has been on Tucker Carlson um, promoting Orban, right? And, you know, Glenn Greenwald is also has the same um, characteristics that Finkelstein did. 
right? He's, he's, uh, you know, gay, Jewish, uh, and he's promoting people who would have him exterminated, frankly. Right. It's, 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 extraordinary. It's, a, it's extraordinary. Well, this is why our investigative reporters are so important and our historians are so important. And I have been doing, um, at night, I'm always researching and looking at the past and trying to, you know, weave things together for the current narrative. And Wayne Barrett called Trump a user of users and said everything was transactional. And our friend Martin Scheel, a criminal, a former uh, criminal IRS investigator, IRS criminal investigator, retired, said these same terms, user of user, uh, every everyone is transactional. Everything is transactional. Need to be applied to Putin. And I wondered what you thought about that because so many of these people that did all this work, uh, you know, decades ago, uh, they are now their work. I think is more relevant now than ever. Right. Uh, I mean, Putin. You know, it's just one thing. I think it's clear to me is what whatever happens with the war in Ukraine, it's not going to be over. In as long as Putin is there. It's not going to be fully over. Wow. As long as he's yes. there. I mean, just think about it. Are you going to trust him in any agreement? <laughs> I don't think no. so. No. I don't think anyone would. I, th- I think that's sort of a consensus on that. And we don't know how long he'll be there. And it, it could be a, a month. It could be five years. And it could be a horror show in between. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very dangerous situation where it could easily escalate. And it's un- unclear what is that tipping point? Um, what, what will that be? I mean, how many more people will die? Uh, and I, I, I don't know the answer and I'm as baffled as anyone. Uh, my, my concern is, is the, the election, you know, and I think 2022 honestly will have a lot to do with that, right? If, um, you know, if the Republicans gain power in Congress, and prevent the president from being able to do anything, right? Well, a- uh, absolutely. It becomes much easier for Putin to to make his moves, um, which is why it's so critical, I think, for us to to get this message out now. Well, yeah. a- a- absolutely. And, and it, what it means is, I mean, it, it's the war in Ukraine was shocking to me in a way because we've seen a different kind of war uh, going on internally. As, as, yeah. Uh, Tim was just talking about I mean, a, 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 a war without bombs or bullets or boots on the ground, with cyber warfare, with disinformation and active measures and so forth. So those two wars are going on simultaneously. I, I was agog at how uh, clumsy and stupid Russia looked uh, on militarily. And especially yeah. after sort of dazzling the world with a, Spectacularly effective active measures. That's right. That's right. That's exactly it's, it's right. Every, this was known as the Gerasimov Doctrine, and it was promoted wow. by a General Gerasimov doc, uh, in, in Russia, who was the chief of staff, I don't know, 10 or 15 years whose ago. Whose nephew, but, whose nephew just got blown up in Ukraine. Right, right. Yes. Who's a well, it's so interesting that you say that we had Monique Kamara on from Kremlin File, and she was talking about, you know, really how uh, the Russian army is a bit stiff, and if we really wanted to, we could crush them, which is obviously not what we what we want to get engaged in. But I do think that where he shines is that KGB, super spy, active measures, whatever it takes. And for me, just hearing you say that these two wars going on simultaneously is just so. Um, it's just I need it. I need to hear it because I am surrounded by people who do not see the information war still. And I don't right, know how right. they can't see it, how they can't see it. Like, where are they getting their information? They still think that I'm, you know, in the theater, call, you know, saying the, the, you know, the theater's on fire. And it's like, I see it very clearly. Clearly you do. Our team members here do. But how do we get the message out? That we are being psy op day in day out right. um, by by the fifth column in America and you know this residue that still continues from you know uh, the active measures from the Kremlin. Right. Well, I, I think one of the problems is social media has created all those silos, and uh, I, yes. I, 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 
<laughs> like an old fart. And I, I grew up with Walter Cronkite and, and Johnny Carson. They spoke to the country, you know? Yeah. Um, and there, um, it's, it's, you know, people assume would have, with millions of voices, it would be more democratic. Mm. I, I think with the algorithms of social media are mixed in, you end up with all these siloed, uh, little, uh, uh, capsules of uh, people talking to each other these oh, echo chambers. The, the insulated echo chambers and yeah. um, and it, what happens in them is people get brainwashed right. right like let's let's just put it on the table people get brainwashed they have undue influence from from having propaganda poured into their brains you know uh, as they go through telegram or twitter <laughs> you know which yeah. is about to happen. Twitter is about to turn into a giant insulated cult like like Telegram and everything else. Right. Well, it's right. algorithmic manipulation. And, and yeah. I think it was intentionally built that way. Yep. I mean, well, uh, I, isn't it true, though, that they make more money just by manipulating that? They, they manipulate the yeah. algorithm to make as much money, and that oh, means God. polarized conversation. And people's biases are. That's right. Yeah, you confirm. So they they've written the algorithm to maximize engagement on the on the platform, and so yeah. as long as they can keep people on the platform, they're making more money, and then people keep the they keep on the platform by providing them more sensational and more sensational content, which tends That's to right. be more radicalized extremist content. So the good news. <clears throat> Yep. We had Dr. Charles Krill on, as you guys know, last week, and the good news is that the EU and the UK are actually making moves to legislate uh, against these online harms, which they are now taking very seriously, and whether or not they will actually enact, you know, criminal, uh, you know, damages into this where, where basically the platform uh, heads would actually be criminally held responsible for their online harms has yet to be seen. But at least there is an awareness that, you know, all they care about is their bottom line, which we've learned. And if their bottom line means that, you know, let people just get nastier and let these, uh, you know, let this online bullying continue incessantly and it makes money for their shareholders, then they, they don't seem to be so worried. But if we actually have legislation and regulation and we treat the online world much in the same way that we treat the offline world, then there could be some changes. Right. Hopefully we'll come up, uh, we'll see in a little bit. There's been a few cases that are in court now, uh, which is accusing these, um, these, uh, social media companies as being defective products. So hopefully a way to get around the 230 is showing that they're a faulty design. And by that, they're liable for negligence, uh, as well as some other things. And some of these cases do involve bullying. So, uh, sadly, we have the, the 11 year old Selena Rodriguez who uh, took her life at 11 years old, which is horrifying. And her mother is suing Snap as well as Meta for liability for the trauma inflicted upon her, resulting in her death, which is horrifying. But I mean, sadly, hopefully, some of these this loss of life can be helpful in, in, in litigation um, to pursue uh, change to these to these platforms. It's just horrifying some of the stuff these kids are going through. Yeah, and you talk about loss of life. Mm -hmm. And we think about uh, all the lives lost under Trump and Craig in an article that you and I did a year and a half ago. He said, if this guy is not held criminally responsible for all of the uh, corruption, fraud and shenanigans that he's been up to, then we are going to be in trouble. And now here we are almost midway through 2022. What do you say? Well, I think we are in trouble. I mean, I, I, you know, the midterms are coming up and, uh, it, it's very scary. Uh, uh, and, uh, if, if, if the Republicans take control then, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what we're looking forward to in 2024. That is, uh, there's, I assume Biden is going to run again, but a lot of people think he's too old and that Kamala isn't going to um be a strong enough candidate and if that happens where are we uh you know so it's, it's a little scary i mean there are a lot of unknowns out there and not to mention the way the republicans have been figuring uh with voting regulations all over the country and uh, 
you know. And, and Absolutely. It, again, and this is something they've been doing for for thirty years, really. I mean, uh, Carl yeah. Rove was doing it uh, way back in the eighties and nineties. Uh, yeah, you can go to the John Birch Society, right? I mean, it 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 goes it goes far back. Um, um, I mean, to 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 me, and I'm curious what your feelings are about this. Like, we we have these parallel wars happening in America and in Ukraine. Um, it seems to me that these moves are clearly coordinated, right, between these people in the United States and Putin, right? I mean, he he inserted Manafort into into Ukraine in 2003, right? Right. To set to to start this whole process of infiltrating Ukraine, setting the setting the stage, the you know Ukraine got um, taken out of the 2016 platform for a reason, right? You can just see all of these moves happening in coordination with people in America, and it's very difficult to understand why these people are not in jail for treason, for espionage, or well, a number of crimes, right? Well, one phrase I say too many times, but the real scandal is what is legal. I mean, yeah. it's, Mike Kinsley first said that, I think, but it, it, it's, you know, and, and I showed this in uh, American Compromise. There was an episode where Donald Trump Jr. Uh, gave a talk before a French think tank. He was paid 50 to $100,000 for it. Uh, it turns out the French think tank was really a front for Russian intelligence. He was given his marching orders from Moscow, literally from Sergei Lavrov, uh, as to what to tell his father, what, what his father, who was about to become president, should do in Syria. And sure enough, the next year, President Trump withdrew American troops from Syria. You know, it, all of that's legal. It's legal. And, and it's one of the big thing problems with the whole Robert Mueller investigation. It should have been a real counterintelligence investigation yeah. instead of it was yeah. a criminal uh, prosecution. And That's there's right. so many things that are perfectly legal. And and if if you're a spy and you're, and you're designing an intelligence operation, you try to design it so it works within the framework of the law. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, but it, it leaves us in a very weird position because. Uh, you know, it's so much of my my books I, I got from they were from FBI files. So of course, mm -hmm. I know that. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> we're we not talk, really doing anything about it. It seems one of our new mantras, thanks to Dr. Charles Creel, is legal but harmful. Legal but harmful. We're going to continually pound that because there are things that are legal but harmful. We need deep structural mm -hmm. change. It's why we need to hold on to every seat that we can hold on to in November. I have two things that are really important to me that I know you can speak to. Roger Stone. Roger Stone floats, you know, Flynn <laughs> 2024. And, you know, Jim has been all over this saying that, you know, Flynn's going to be running for president. So Roger Stone floats it. But, but Roger Stone, for many people, um, is still seen as some sort of, you know, clown or enigma or whatever. You know, we hear think of him as a very dangerous person. You personally have encountered him. Can you kind of give us your summary of Stone and what we need to know about him? Because I know that he can be charming if, if uh, you know, he's one of your sources. Well, he's, he, he's always playing you and you know it, but he's, he knows you know it, but it's kind of fun. He has fun with it. Uh, and uh, so he'll tell you wild stories, sex stories about himself. I, I was interviewing him once about uh, Elliot Spitzer, who had been uh, uh, governor of New York. And if you remember the scandal of client number nine, Roger Stone uh, was one of the key people who initiated that. He yeah. put in calls to the FBI. And I asked him how he knew about it. And he made up some uh, story which did not seem credible. And... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, he, he he said he was at a strip club that uh, um, a hooker came up to him and said she had lots of famous clients and name name that sir. Um, 
it's kind of didn't bring true to me, if you know what I mean. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, I was just in the strip club. She's trying to impress him with, that, with her discretion. She she kind of failed. Yeah, and now he's hanging out with the Hollywood madam. So I kind of don't believe that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, well, he's he, been hanging he out with her a, for a long time. In, I believe it was in 1996. I think he was a, uh, yeah. on the Robert Dole campaign. He and his wife had been taking out ads uh, in Swinger publications that were extremely <laughs> graphic. <laughs> there were measurements in it. Let's all Yes, use. I, I remember that. Um, and, and, and it became a scandal. And he was sort of fired from the Dole campaign because... These weren't Republican family values. Yeah, and can I tell a joke? Again? No one else gives a shit, right? Like right. everyone else is like, whatever, fine. Like, you know, right. Whatever. Well, no, I mean, since then, I think uh, Republicans' uh, tolerance for hypocrisy is weak. Yeah, right. exactly. So we we don't even bother to point it right. out anymore. Right. Yeah. I, I, I got to tell you this joke, Craig. What's the worst thing about dating Roger Stone? Oh, stop. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Having him watch you have sex. <laughs> oh. Can we cut it in post? I can't help it. Yeah, yeah we'll sorry. cut that in post. Yeah. Cut it in post. Um, so on to more serious matters. Um, obviously, having written House of Trump, House of Putin, and American Compromat, and quite frankly, dug, digging into this Trump-Russia story like nobody, um, when you hear about the rash of dead oligarchs, the, the oligarchs suiciding themselves, what do you see from your lens, you know, um, and your, you know, profound experience? Um, obviously, you know, up to interpretation. We're not looking for definitives here. But when you know that, you know, five key oligarchs just suicided themselves in the last few weeks, you know. Right. I, I, I don't like to make any pronouncements unless I've investigated myself. I mean, but at the same time, you know. That Putin is capable of murder, and and I think going past to the apartment bombings of 1999, to the the murder of uh, Alexander Litvinenko, uh, of uh, Paul Klebnikov, uh, of uh, uh, and there, there's so many. I, I'm going to miss a few of the names, but it, but clearly he's done that before, and he will do it. Is willing to do it again, and I, I think in the case of Ukraine, what you you're going to get down to that that's very scary is will he use tactical nukes which right. he was threatened to use and and uh, that's a real possibility and uh, if that happens uh yeah be very interesting yeah i mean I, I the robert j lifton wrote an important article that you know talking about how his how putin is now a totalitarian right He's always been an authoritarian. Um, he's always used those those techniques. He's always been a fascist at heart. Um, but he seems to have, over the COVID holidays, as it were, isolated himself and, you know, effectively be has believed his own propaganda to the point where he thinks that, you know, um, Third Reich level um, atrocities are acceptable to meet his his goals and i think that means that nukes are on the table for him right um, and, and it means that that it's a different it's a different we're playing at a different level than i think just ground troops on the in ukraine right and it's hard to believe nato will just sit by if that happens yeah well um, andrea andrea chalupa thinks that they are not because she feels that one thing that putin is so afraid of is death and he will assure his own death if he pulls something like that she thinks it's going to be more like the dirty the dirty low level that we talked about with paul mason uh, either way it's bad either way we're looking at a war of annihilation no matter how much he escalates it um but you know again having studied putin and you know, how he, uh, how he operates. Um, what do you think is going to happen in the next few weeks and months? What do you think he's going to, you know, ha which way do you think he's going to go? Is he going to announce victory at the May Day parade or, yeah. is he, you know, 
you know, I, I don't have a better idea than anyone else. And the, yeah. I mean, the interesting thing about all this, I think, has been is the there's been a real consensus in the analysis that no one expected Ukraine's doing a thousand times better than anyone expected, yeah. and Russia just seems uh, completely inept when it comes to the military. Um, but I don't know how it plays out. I mean, the, the thing is, I, I think I don't see an all. There's no off ramp for Putin. I mean, uh, I mean, does he right. play the victory now? I mean, or I think he has to at least keep that part of the Donbass. Uh, uh, but I don't see how he can. You know, the the, the other thing is, that, I, I mean, one of the big questions is it seems you, you were talking a little earlier about it being a totalitarian, and and how much is it a totalitarian society? And it looks so far that he's pretty much kept the lid on what the Russian people know. But I can't yeah. believe that goes on forever. I was with so many losses. I just can't believe it. Uh, um. Well, yeah. I mean, it's ha it's happened before, right? I mean, it, it. I think it's different now because there's so much communication out there, right? Um, but Russia, I mean, you've seen the the phone calls between people in Ukraine and their parents, yes, right? Yes, no, I have, I have. I where do. the where the parents are are like, no, you're not being bombed, mm -hmm. you know, where the 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 brainwashing and the insulation and the propaganda is so bad that that parents don't believe their kids, you know. Right. I mean, we'll see. I just don't know if that can last indefinitely. I mean, I I hope not. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. All right. So I, I have one question I'd really like to ask you. And uh, it's about your article in the New Republic about CPAC going to Hungary. Uh, one of the things we know is with all the sanctions that have occurred and all the uh, higher scrutiny that banks are receiving, like Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank, um, you know, Russian money laundering is, is, you know, that faucet is being cranked off, right? Uh, do you feel that part of the reason uh, the GOP and CPAC are occurring in Hungary is possibly so that they can establish new money laundering routes? And if so, would it behoove NATO intelligence, EU intelligence, American intelligence to keep an eye on those conduits? For illegal money. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, I think this is. Um, did, did you ever watch the Third Man, the great movie, The Third Man? Uh, this is that's what Budapest is now. I mean, it, it's just. Uh, um, it is. Think about it. In in all of the EU, in all of NATO, there's only one country that is pro Putin, Hungary, mm -hmm. and so it it is. Um, just open season for Soviet spies to be there. There are thousands of them. And there are all these international institutions and banks and so forth. And yes, I think it, it, it's a way to divvy up the, the proceeds again. I mean, without, um, you know, I, I, in House of Trump, I wrote about a meeting in 1995 with all the Russian mobsters and Russia was just becoming a, a, a mafia state. And they would say to, Mogulev, it's in third task. Well, you can have liquid natural gas and uh, they are possible we'll get aluminum. You know, this kind of thing has to keep going on. And and, and uh, the sanctions do shut off some of the valves. I, I mean, someone I, I haven't done as deep a dive into this as is necessary, which is, uh, I, you know, my understanding is sanctions are only if we just do sanctions. It's not that effective if the EU and UK doesn't do them as well. Right. So you have to turn off as many uh, spigots as possible. Mm -hmm. And that requires a deep dive in many different industries, many different companies. And I, I have not done that. I'm super excited about our Klepto Capture Task Force because they are, there was an arrested Jack Hannock, former Fox uh, News producer who created a pro Putin right. propaganda yeah, network that. for. Malafia, then there's the indictment against Malafia, and then there's the bounty on Mogolovich. So it feels to me, and then, of course, Deutsche Bank just calling, you know, being its own whistleblower, saying, oh, we may have some money laundering here. So there seems to be certain things that are at least giving this old journal a bit of hope. Right. Um, 
I hope so. You know, it, 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 we have been so lax on oversight. It's just, it's just mind boggling. And, and to the question that we were talking about earlier, I, money laundering, it's not, um, the, the regulations in rent, uh, in real estate are just pathetic. And, and they're being tightened some up, up somewhat, but I don't know if they're being tightened enough. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw another name in here, uh, Mercer. Um, so Mercer, um, uh, I think, and a lot of, and others also believe that Mercer is laundering a lot of, of Putin's money or has through his head funds, right? Um, which is in terms of scale, uh, I mean, real estate, obviously, there's a good load of money in real estate as well. Um, but when you have these giant quants, right, you have these $25, $50 billion quant head, head funds that are just black boxes. And you have no idea what goes in or goes out of it. Um, it, it, it becomes basically, a you know, a, a black box for Putin to put money in and then for um, it to come out the other side and operations that benefit him. And I've been, I just, you can just see this, this sort of chain of custody from Putin to Mercer to Peter Thiel and a bunch of his kind of accolades, um, out into American, you know, into the American public mind. Um, so I, I apologize for that, but, uh, but <laughs> how, how much of Mercer have you seen in your, in your travels? That's really not my specialty. I'm afraid I, I do, I do uh, look Not forward to the whistleblower within Rentec. You know, they had some early, uh, you know, Russian wunderkinds in there. And I do look forward to somebody from the inside actually finally exposing them. And unfortunately, it's not just Mercer, as we learned with Nancy McLean. You have the Coke cadre, and then you look yeah. at what we, what we learned from Ann Nelson with the CNP, how they're all working with, you know, World Congress of Families, and that's what ties them to the Kremlin, and it is all such a, it becomes less of a strange bed, less strange bedfellows when you frame it with the fossil fuel interests and the uh, white supremacy interests. And you can kind of see a lot of the linkages. Um, but yes, I know we only have you for just a couple more minutes. So I would love for you to just kind of, um, last time your final word to us was, you feel like we're looking at like, you know, everybody needs to watch Manchurian Candidate to see what's actually really going on. It is my great frustration. And I'm very grateful we have this platform. I'm very grateful that I get to do the work I get to do for reader funded byline times. But I still feel like there is just this vast swath of our population that has not woken up to the fifth column in America. And if you have another way that you can just sort of obviously people need to read your book number one uh because this has been a long game but is there anything kind of new in your mind that you feel could actually sort of uh stimulate conversation among well you raise in my mind a desire i don't know if anyone can fulfill it but i would love to be able to break through those silos in in, in social media and i don't know if there's some techie you can devise algorithms to help that take place Wow. Um, but it, it would be, uh, it, it, it's very, very frustrating because, uh, you know, I, I've been both an editor and a writer and you choose your stories carefully. And, but you, as an editor and you, you want a, the right mix, you want to have a certain depth to certain kinds of stories and some are more important than others. But the way people get their news today is, you know, you got your little phone yeah. and headlines. Growing top and maybe read one, one paragraph and that's it. So I, I think the, the whole notion of penetrating that world is, is very, very difficult. And I wish to hell, uh, there were someone to come up with it, uh, uh, some advice in helping, uh, us to do it because I think it's very important. I love that concept. Regulation. Algorithms, well, but the well, absolutely. Algorithms for good. Find a way to make it for good. That's a very interesting well, concept. People will go for profit over good, I think, and they're going to cite their obligations to shareholders and so forth. Uh, and it, it's very hard. But but yeah. they, they, you know, and I, I fear that the Democrats aren't 
Uh, I mean, Democrats have never had a firm enough hold on Congress to regulate anyone, but social media, they're also getting uh, big contributions from Silicon Valley as well. Yes, right. Yes, that's I just want right. Walter Cronkite back. I mean, <laughs> that guy. That's, oh, that's what I grew up on. And that's the way it is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. That should be our final ending, but I just yeah. want you just to give us, I'm so sorry, I'm being greedy, but one line or thought about Giuliani, because few people know him better than you. He just got sanctioned <laughs> by Iran. Can you just, what comes to mind on Rudy? No, he's just become a clown, and it, it, it's sort of pathetic. And, uh, you know, I, I think of him with uh, his dyed hair dripping down, you know, he's sweating, and the hair dye is dripping down his forehead, and he just sort of wince. That, that's my image of uh, Giuliani. It's, it's also, there's something operatic about him. He, he considered himself a great fan of opera, and I, I sort of see him as, I'm not, maybe. I mean, oh, I speaking, that, speaking okay. of Ukraine, what was Giuliani doing in 2019, right? right. He was over in Ukraine trying to get right. Zelensky yeah. to participate right. in his propaganda operation against Joe Biden, right? right. I mean, think about that. In 2019, right. you can see right? now that Zelensky Why knew what was, really Biden. knew what was going on and handled yeah. himself very adroitly, given that he was totally dependent on these clowns. Uh, right. If I were casting for the new Walter Cronkite, I think it would be Craig Unger. Uh, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I do, really do it. Do it for us, Craig. Take your glasses I'm, off and go. That's the way it is. And that's the way it is. All right. <laughs> we love you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Craig. Well, thank you. Okay. Bye. All of this you. information will be on our website. Thank, thank you, you so sir. much, Craig Unger. You rule. Thanks. Bye. Well, I gotta say, if that's not the best. Amazing. Goddamn show. I don't know what it is. Every episode. <laughs> you say that every time. You say that you every time. Give him the Conkright job. It is. That's, that's what I think. It is. Yeah. Give What's that? Give him oh, a Walter Cronkite job, right? Well, he's yeah. also got that lovely trusting face. It's a bit yeah. beatific. You know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. the whole thing that Cronkite had. People trusted him from whatever walk of life they came from. So, yes, you know, maybe uh, we'll have to uh, grow our brand and bring him on as our Walter Cronkite. Or just as our Craig Unger. He's rad. Yeah, she's as Craig Unger. Love you guys. Thank you so see much you guys. for another brilliant episode. Mwah. We'll see you later. See you later.